Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. Indeed, you are so great. Lord, our words are not adequate and our time is not sufficient to even begin to fathom or explore or confess your greatness. So, Lord, we pause one more time just to say thank you. Thank you for who you are and for what you do, and thank you for being a great, great Father. We love you. We thank you. We ask your blessing now on this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. For as long as I can remember, I've wanted to fly. Anybody else want to fly when you were a kid? I think it's a common thing. A lot of us uh, probably wanted to do that. I mean, I remember my first airplane ride. I remember the first time I got to sit up in the cockpit. They'll still let little kids do that, but they won't let me do it anymore. (laughs) But I I can remember being a kid out there in the hayfield hauling square bells and seeing those F-16s flying over on their way to the bombing range and thinking, I want to do that. I wish I was there instead of here. <laughs> I'd love to fly an airplane and get to drop bombs on stuff. It seemed like such a cool thing as a kid, right? I've always wanted to fly. When I was about five years old, my grandpa bought me a little miniature three-wheeler. It was one of those deals, kind of like the, the, the cars we buy for our kids now. It had a battery in it. You know, the little car you can drive around in your yard or out on the street or whatever. It doesn't go very fast, but it's just cool when you're a little kid getting to drive something. Well, he bought me and my cousin. My cousin's just a hair older than me. We're practically the same age. He's a little older, but he bought us both for Christmas, one of those little three-wheelers. I still remember it. It was yellow. Stuff was made better back then, amen? I mean, it had some plastic on it, but boy, I mean, these things were made pretty good. We spent the next couple of years wearing them out, out there on the ranch, and as we got a little bit older, they, they got a little bit slower. <laughs> the batteries wouldn't hold a charge as good, and they just didn't move fast enough for us. So one day, uh, we got the bright idea to just rip the motor and batteries and all the guts out of it so we could push it. it had a little handle on the back you could push. And we did that for a while, but We started losing interest in them, and we played with them a little less often. But one day, we were standing out there, and I remember looking over there at mine and thinking, you know, that would probably make a pretty good airplane. I think I could fly that. If we could put some wings on it, some control surfaces, if we could get it off the ground, I could fly it. Now, I'd never flown anything in my life, but I was sure I could fly a three-wheeler. So we spent the rest of that day going through the junk pile, pulling out plywood and other materials we could find, building us some wings and some control surfaces, and, you know, we had it all rigged up. We went and got us some baling wire and some duct tape. Start of a good airplane always, always has a lot of baling wire and duct tape on it. And we attached those wings, and my cousin began to push me. And we thought we almost got it off the ground one time. We were pretty sure it was going to fly. We just needed a little more speed. And he never could get me enough speed for me to take off. And so we went and caught a horse. (laughs) Saddled that horse. Attached a rope to that three-wheeler. And he pulled me behind that horse. And and we were pretty sure it it did one of these. It kind of hopped a little like it was about... To fly, but it just wasn't quite enough. And so it was about that time we ended up, y'all don't know the layout of the farm where I, where I was at or where I grew up, but we were down by the grain bins, and there's a great big hay barn down there. I mean, I mean it was massive. The size of this building are bigger, real tall ceiling. The peak probably wasn't as tall as this. It had a real gentle sloping roof, but long. And I remember looking up there and go, you know what? If we could get that three-wheeler up on that roof and take it up to the peak, and if Jay would push me with all his might, and I could roll down that tin, when I got to the end, if I had a little bit of altitude, this thing's going to fly. And so we talked about it for a long time, and we all decided it was a pretty good idea, and so we worked, and we got that thing up on that roof somehow. 
We rolled it up to the peak. We turned it into the wind. We knew just enough to try to kill ourselves. <laughs> and I remember my cousin saying, do you, do you really think this is a good idea? And I said, I can fly it. And he said, okay. And so we looked and made sure the landing zone was clear. We had already gone about 75 yards out the other side of the barn, made sure all the debris was out of the way. We had a good landing place. You know, on the other side of the mesquite trees and the barbed wire fence, there was a great just place to land. Checked everything one last time, and I said, let's go. And he pushed, and he ran until that little three-wheeler outran him, and he stopped, and there I was, just rolling down that roof. And I remember getting about 10 feet from the end of that roof, thinking, today's the day I'm going to fly. I believed I was going to fly. I remember getting right up to the edge and looking up because I knew I was going to fly. And then I just remember unexplainedly and unexpectedly, without any warning, seeing the ground <laughs> moving toward me at a high rate of speed. The next thing I remember was... My brothers and my cousins all kind of standing around me. And I was laying on the ground and my little three-wheeler was busted up in a bunch of different pieces. And I didn't fly. You know what I did? I fell. There's a difference between flying and falling, amen? amen. A big difference. <laughs> a really big difference. And I didn't know why I fell. I didn't know why I didn't fly. I had no idea. In fact, it wouldn't be until I was 16 years old and I went and took my very first flight lesson that I realized why I fell instead of flew all those years before. You see, when I took my first actual flying lesson before we ever got in the airplane, the instructor sat me down and we started talking about things like aerodynamics. And we talked about a very important principle called Brunali's principle. It's the principle of lift. It's what makes things fly. When you understand it, you fly. When you obey it, you fly. When you don't understand it and you don't obey it, you fall. You don't fly. And that's how a principle works, right? A principle is the same for everybody. It doesn't matter what color you are, how rich you are. It doesn't matter how smart or how dumb you are. A principle works the same for everybody. And here's the other thing about a principle. It doesn't matter how much you believe in it or how much you don't believe it. A principle still works or doesn't based on the principle. I believed I was going to fly that day, but I still fell because that's how a principle works. It doesn't matter what you believe. There are other people who don't think airplanes can fly, but it doesn't matter what they believe. I flew on several this week. They fly because of the principle. Today we're going to talk about two more big principles in the Bible, and I want you to grasp this. I want you to understand that these principles work whether you believe they work or not. They, they work whether you think it'll work in your situation or not, because they're principles, and principles work. Understanding and observing God's principles will produce blessings in your life. In short, you will fly if you obey God's principles. But if you don't, not understanding them and not obeying them will produce pain and hardship and difficulty. In short, you will fall because that's how principles work. So let's talk about our first one. It's the principle of rest. It's not a popular principle in the Word of God. It's not a principle we talk about often. It's not one we certainly obey very much. It's not one of the most practiced principles in Scripture. In fact, in our culture, it's one that almost always gets ignored, overlooked, and minimized. Some of you know I did my doctoral work on the Sabbath, rediscovering the joy of the Sabbath. Because I spent so much time studying this for my doctoral work, I can tell you without hesitation that I've read every scripture the Bible has to offer on the subject. I've read it frontwards and I've read it backwards. I've read it in multiple languages. I've easily read from cover to cover over 50 books on the topic, and I've probably surveyed and skimmed through another 150 or 200 more. 
Many would consider me an expert on the subject. In fact, not long ago, I was invited to come speak on this very topic because of the work I've done and the project I did and from what I know about this principle of biblical rest. You know what the sad thing is, though, is I don't do it very much. You see, you can know a lot about a principle and still not do it. You can know a lot about the effects of a principle and see the blessings of a principle and still not do it. And you might say, well, how can that be? Like, what? you only work 30 minutes on Sunday, preacher. What, what are you doing the rest of the week? <laughs> but my life is just like yours. There's so much to do and so little time to get it all done. It's easy to fill my schedule with all the activities and responsibilities that come my way. It's easy to put rest on the back burner and think, oh, I'll do it next week or I'll do better next time. But the principle is the same for me as it is for you. There's a principle that's working all around us when it comes to rest. And we don't have to believe it. We don't have to understand it. We don't even have to do it. But it's still there. I was on a few flights this week, as I mentioned a moment ago. I travel a good bit these days. And so I've become very comfortable with air travel. It's second nature to me. But I was sitting next to a guy on one of these flights who wasn't. In fact, this was his very first airplane ride. He wasn't a teenager. He wasn't a little kid. He was older than me. He'd never been on an airplane before, and he was extremely uncomfortable. From the time we sat down, he was sitting in the middle. I was on the aisle. There was another lady over by the window. And from the time we sat down, I mean, he was sweating. He was nervous. Hey, have you ever done this before? Yeah, I've done it. Yeah. Is it, what's it like? Is it okay? Yeah, it's fine. We were talking the whole time they're loading the plane. And then he said these words. He said, I just can't believe this thing's going to get off the ground. He said, with all of us in here, I think he was saying, look how fat you are. (laughs) But he said, with all of us in here, with all of our luggage underneath, with all of the fuel in the wings, with all of the wiring and the avionics, I mean, how much does this thing weigh? I just don't believe it's going to get off the ground. In fact, as the boarding was coming to an end, he was almost going to get off. He said, I think I'm going to get off. I I think I I just can't do this. I think I'm just going to drive. I say, hey, do whatever you want, but this thing's going to fly. He said, I just can't believe it's going to get off the ground. Well, they shut the door, and I said, well, you're stuck now. (laughs) We were pushing back, and he said, I just can't believe this thing's going to fly. I said, man, don't worry about it. Listen, I'm actually a pilot. I can promise you these guys, they've done the weight and balance. There's computers. There's people in Dallas checking this stuff. Like, this stuff has been checked and triple-checked and quadruple-checked. This thing's going to get off the ground. He said, I don't believe it. I just don't think it's going to fly. And we were taxiing the whole way. He was just nervous saying stuff like that. We pulled out onto the runway, and he said, I don't think this is going to work. I don't think this is going to work. I said, it's going to work. It's going to work. Relax. And sure enough, then, they pushed those throttles forward. They gunned it. They gave it the gas. And you know how it is on an airplane. You start off slow. That thing started to roll and started to move, and we were getting a little faster. And he looked at me, and he goes, we're not going fast enough. It's not going to fly. And I said, it's going to be fine. Give it a second. We went a little further, and he said, this thing's never going to fly. And then about then, the nose came up, the wheels came off the ground, and we were flying. You see, he didn't believe it was going to fly. He didn't understand what makes an airplane fly, but guess what? It still flew. The plane kept on flying, got us all the way home safely to San Antonio, not because he knew anything about airplanes, not because of what he believed or what I believed. It's because of the principle. You know, God put this principle in Genesis chapter 2. He wove it into creation itself into the DNA of the universe we live in. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, it says, On the seventh day God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And God blessed the seventh day, and he declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. Right there from the very beginning we see the rhythm of rest. The principle of rest introduced into our world. We find it again in Exodus 20 in what we call commonly the Ten Commandments. 
The principle of rest is right there in the Ten Commandments. It's actually the longest and the most detailed of all the commandments that God gives His people. Here's what it says in Exodus 20, starting in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, your livestock or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he declared it holy. You see, the Lord himself blessed the day of rest at the time of creation. And again here, he says, I'm going to bless you through it and give you the freedom to enjoy the rhythm of it. The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he declared it holy. You may not believe it's holy, but it's holy. You may not believe it's a real thing or a real principle or it really works, but it does. Because God declared it holy. You remember what I told you in the beginning that understanding and observing or obeying God's principles will produce blessing in your life? God has blessed this principle no matter what you believe. He's declared it holy. And it works. But if you ignore the principle, it's still there. It just won't be a blessing to your life. You know what got Jesus in trouble a whole bunch with the Pharisees and Sadducees, all the religious people of his day? I mean, they just beat him up over this. The Sabbath. It was the principle of the Sabbath. They they had a, I mean, they butt heads over this a bunch. And the reason was the religious leaders of the day had perverted the intent of the Sabbath. They were using it to manipulate and abuse and control people. And that was never the intent of it. So Jesus said some stuff about the Sabbath that really got him in trouble. We'll just look at a few of them here in Mark chapter 2, verse 27. It says, Then he told them the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So then the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. So there are two things there that got him in trouble. Jesus was completely right. The Sabbath was always intended to be a blessing for you and for me wasn't intended to be a burden. It was intended to be a blessing. It was made for us. God put this principle into the fabric of creation to be a blessing. But it's that second part, when Jesus claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath, that they totally lost their minds. They simply could not accept that at all. We could talk about that for hours today, but it's not the focus of our message. What I really want you to understand is that rest is a biblical principle that's intended to bless your life. If you do it, you'll fly, and if you don't, you'll fall. It's not there to take away your one day off. It's not there to take away your one day of fun. It's not there to ruin your plans. It's it's not there to punish you or to prohibit you from enjoying all that life has to offer. It's there to bless you and me. It's a divine blessing that we all have the opportunity to embrace or reject. It's a divine principle that we can all obey or disobey. And understanding and obeying this principle will produce blessings in your life, and not doing it will produce hardship. You know, I looked back this week at some of the data I collected when I was doing that project on the Sabbath, biblical rest. Of all the participants that were a part of the study group, We surveyed them at the beginning and the end and throughout the study. But what we found at the beginning was 22%, only 22% thought that participating in a day of rest was important. And most of that 22% wasn't doing it, but they just said, well, God said it, so it probably is. But the rest, everybody else said, no, it's not important. At the end of the study, 98% said it was important. 90% of the respondents reported at the end of the study sleeping better than at the beginning of the study. 90%. Of the participants that were on high blood pressure medicine, which a lot of them were, many of us are, every single one, 100%, reported 
an average drop in their blood pressure at the end of eight weeks of practicing the Sabbath. A big drop, too. Several people, the doctors actually told them they could come off their blood pressure medicine. They had doctor's appointments in the middle of this study, and they said, man, your blood pressure's way down. Get, get off that stuff. They were weaning them off of it. 94% of the participants reported, and this was the most surprising, at the end of the study, 94% of the people reported that they were accomplishing more in working six days and resting one than they were before when they were working seven days and resting none. Everyone who did the study found that it was a blessing in their life in some way, shape, or form. Because it's a principle that works. I really do believe that for most of us, the stress we have and the worry we carry the anxiety we hide from everybody, the trauma we suffer from, the frustrations we won't face, and much, much more would be impacted in a very positive way if we would just embrace this wonderful principle of rest. The principle of the Sabbath. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, understanding and obeying God's principles produces blessing in your life. You'll fly. So I want to encourage you to fly. I want to encourage you to strongly consider practicing a day of rest each week, a day that you just worship the Lord, and I think you're going to be surprised at how much this one principle will change your life. I know some people will argue, well, I'm not Jewish. This is for the Jews. No, this is a principle. It's a principle that's at work around you, and you can enjoy it and be blessed by it or not. But it's a principle that will work. Number two, second principle we're going to look at today is God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty, it's another big one. It's one we could easily spend weeks, if not months, talking about and probably still only scratch the surface. But today I just want you to survey this big idea with me of the sovereignty of God. The Bible dictionaries define God's sovereignty in two ways. I want to read two of them to you. I think it kind of encapsulates what sovereignty is. I realize it's a big religious biblical word that Some of you might have heard, but maybe don't really understand, and that's fine. You're kind of getting your feet wet with it. So here's how one Bible dictionary described it. The sovereignty of God is the biblical teaching that God possesses all power and is the ruler of all things. Another said it this way. The sovereignty of God is God's absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure. In short, God can do whatever he wants. You can't do whatever you want. I can't do whatever I want, but God can. You want to know why? He's sovereign over everything. He's sovereign over everything. Right? Think about the areas of your life that you're sovereign over. Those are the areas you can do whatever you want in it. For some of you, it's it's at your house. You can do whatever you want at your house, but you don't get to do whatever you want where you work, do you? Some of you are like, I can't do whatever I want at my house. She won't let me. (laughs) That means you're not sovereign there. Right? Right? We all have these little areas of our life that we're sovereign over. We can do whatever we want in that area, but we can't do whatever we want in this other area. Listen, God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. It don't matter. He can do it because he's God. He's sovereign over all of it. Does that make sense? And this is the reality. We can learn to rest in the sovereignty of God. There's a reason I talked about rest early on because this coordinates with his sovereignty we can learn to rest in his sovereignty and we can learn to get the blessings of resting in his sovereignty or we can fight against it but it's not going to change his sovereignty because his sovereignty is a principle it's there it's like gravity it affects everybody now i'm not saying or suggesting that it's easy that it's natural that it's fun or that it's simple to rest in the sovereignty of god it's Certainly not. But I am suggesting that understanding the principle of God's sovereignty will produce blessings if you're in your life if you accept it and obey it. I was thinking and praying deeply this week on this topic, trying to figure out what to do with the limited amount of time we have to cover it. And the Lord just really revealed to me what I believe are the three biggest reasons why we don't embrace God's sovereignty in our lives. 
Even those of us who know about the sovereignty of God, just like we know about resting, we're probably not really, really practicing it, right? We're probably not really resting in God's sovereignty. Even if we can talk about it or write a book on it, we're probably not doing it. And why don't we? Why don't we really rest and embrace in this principle that's so important? I think there are three reasons. The first one is this, our plans. The reason we won't rest in God's sovereignty is because, well, we're making lots of plans. And we put a lot of effort into our plans. And sometimes the sovereignty of God butts up against our plans. We think we're real smart. We think we're real good at planning things ourselves. The Bible has a lot to say about us planning things. When we take our plans and we put them in place of God's sovereignty, we're always sure to fall. The Bible teaches us that over and over and over again. It doesn't, it doesn't say much positive about you and I, our ability to plan things. Proverbs 19.21, for example, says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. You can plan whatever you want, but God's sovereign. James chapter 4, 13 through 16 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you should say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. In other words, you're real good at making plans, but you can't do anything to make sure they happen because he's sovereign. Proverbs 27.1 says, Don't boast about tomorrow, for you don't know what a day might bring. There's a lot more, but they're all kind of basically in line with those, right? The reality is, is no matter what we might think, no matter how good we might think we are, no matter how smart we might be, we can put all the thinking power of all of our brains in this room right now together, and we still couldn't outthink God. We couldn't even get close. We, we, there's no way we could plan anything better than God. He's a much, much better planner than we are. Some of y'all don't believe that, so you need, to, you need to hear it. I want you to turn and look at somebody and say, God's a better planner than you. Yeah, most of y'all don't even believe that. You're kind of whispering it like, well, God's a better planner than you. No, he's a better planner than you. Some of y'all are like, I ain't telling my wife that. Mm-mm. No, sir. You ain't got to ride home with her. No. And you get mouthy in church. I know it's hard to believe, though, right? It's really hard to believe that God's a better planner than us when we lose a child. I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's what we're talking about, God's sovereignty, resting in it, trusting in it. It's really hard to believe that God's a better planner than us when our career is cut short. It's really hard to believe that he's a better planner than us when our dreams are shattered. It's really hard to believe that he's a better planner than us when our spouse dies at an unexpected time at an early age. It's hard to believe it. You see, I know that the sovereign will of God does not always make sense and is not always easy to accept. The sovereign will of God won't always make you happy. It won't always make life simple. But if you will learn to rest in it, there's a principle there and a blessing there for you when you will learn to rest in his sovereignty. Proverbs 16 offers two pieces of great advice on this. The first comes in verse 3 where it says, Commit your activities to the Lord and your plans will be established. In other words, there's nothing wrong with making plans so long as your plans are God's plans. The problem is when our plans aren't God's plans. Because he's sovereign and whatever he has planned is going to happen. So we need to commit our plans to the Lord. We need to make sure whatever we're planning is his plan. We need to run it by him and make sure we're on the right path. We need to make sure we're in his will. We're not asking him to join us in making our will happen, right? Because his plans are good plans. 
The second great piece of advice comes in verse 9 of Proverbs 16, where it says, A person's heart plans his ways, but the Lord determines his steps. You see, we have to understand that no matter what it is, no matter what it is, it's the Lord who's guiding our steps and leading us. And if we will listen to him, if we will learn from him, if we will follow him, if we will obey him, if we will seek him, then we will find him. And we will find blessings on our path, even if we find ourselves on a very, very tough path. Because we can rest inside of his sovereign will because we understand the power of that principle. His plans are always right. His plans are always the right plans. Tell somebody that. His plans are always the right plans. His ways are always the right ways. You know, sometimes you just got to stand in front of the mirror and tell yourself that. I don't know what God's doing, but his plans are right. I don't know what God's doing here, but his ways are right. You know who talks to you the most? Who talks to you the most? You. You talk to you the most. You're talking to yourself all day, every day. Half the problems in your life, you talked yourself into them. (laughs) Probably more than half. We're being honest, right? Because we talk to ourselves all the time. Half the stuff you believe, probably more than half, is stuff you've talked yourself into believing. You need to go look in the mirror and you need to start speaking some scripture over you. Some promises of God over you. You need to remember what God says. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, For I know the plans I have for you. Now, now, my wife was reminding me this um, after the first service, and I thought about talking about it. I, I just want to share it real quick. This comes after God tells them it's going to be rough for 70 years. He basically says your whole life is going to be really, really tough but I've got something planned 70 years from now. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration, it says, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Some of y'all, you just got to go stand in front of the mirror. You need to get inside your head and say, you know what, I know God has plans for me. Plans for hope, plans for a future, not plans of disaster, good plans. And his sovereign will includes good plans for me, plans for my well-being, plans for a great future, plans filled with hope. you got to let go of your plans and get on his plan, rest in his sovereign will, and you're going to find life works a whole lot better if you get on that principle. The second thing that gets in our way is our priorities. It's not just our plans, it's our priorities that messes up. See, we struggle to rest and trust in God's sovereignty because so many times our priorities are getting in the way. The reality is we're prioritizing the wrong stuff most of the time. We prioritize wealth, we prioritize retirement, we prioritize safety and security, we prioritize material possessions, we prioritize fun and recreation we prioritize entertainment we prioritize sports and social activities we prioritize politics over God we got a lot of priorities that are out of whack and our priorities are what we're focusing on and what we're thinking about and what we're putting our money and our effort and our energy into and they're really not right most of the time So the problem is, when our priorities butt up against God's priorities, we get surprised and we start to struggle to rest in His sovereignty because our priorities are wrong. Not because His are wrong, His priorities are right. But our priorities don't look like His priorities because we've got the wrong priorities. And so we can't trust in His sovereignty because we're trusting in our plans and our priorities. I think this is in part why Paul wrote things like Philippians 4.8 where he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, he says, if there is any moral excellence and if there 
is anything praiseworthy. Dwell on these things. Think about these things. Prioritize these things. Bring these things to the surface in your life. Because when we're not thinking about and prioritizing the right things, we're certain to fall out of step with the Lord. See, to rest in God's sovereignty, we must possess God's priorities for our lives. To the Colossians, Paul wrote in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, So if you have been raised with Christ, in other words, if you're a believer, if you're a disciple, if you are saved, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, what does he say to do? He says, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He says, set your minds on things above, not earthly things, for you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You see, here we see that for the Christian, our priorities are not the same as those who live in the world. We prioritize and seek things that are above, not things that are in front of us or around us. Or at least we're supposed to. We're supposed to set our minds on the things that are above us, not the things that are around us. And when we do that, we remove a major barrier to accepting and trusting God's sovereign will in our life. Jesus said this in Matthew 6.33. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. In other words, trust in God's sovereign will. Seek his kingdom first. Get your priorities right. And then everything else is going to line up. It makes sense because God's sovereign will is always best. If you want to learn to rest in God's sovereignty, then you must possess the priorities of God. It is that simple. If you don't, you will be extremely, extremely disappointed, and it will be extremely, extremely hard to enjoy the blessings of resting in His sovereignty. If you do, you'll fly. If you don't, you'll fall. And here's the third reason we don't trust God's sovereignty. We don't embrace it and rest in it. It's our perspective. You see, many times we just have a very, very poor perspective about life. We don't look at things the right way. You know, we admire the Apostle Paul for many reasons, but one of the reasons is he wrote things like Romans 8.28. In Romans 8.28, he says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. He talks right there about God's sovereignty, that everything's going to work together. God's got the plans already figured out. He goes on in the verses to follow to talk about that even more as it relates to salvation. Paul wrote a lot of stuff like that. You know, Paul's the guy who was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was abused, he was mistreated, he was laughed at. He was made fun of. He was run out of town. He had to be lowered down walls and baskets. He's the guy, he gets arrested over there in Philippi, and him and Silas are thrown in prison. And at midnight, chained to the walls and the floor, him and Silas are singing hymns, praising God. I get thrown in jail. I ain't going to be singing no hymns. I'll be scared to death. He's just singing hymns, trusting God. This wasn't the kind of prison where you were getting fed good and had air conditioning, had a doctor to come check on you and bandage your wounds, had people caring about you and loving on you. No, 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 it was a different kind of prison. And he's just praising God because he understood that God was sovereign, that God had it in control. He's able to sing in that moment and many others because he's resting in the sovereignty of of God. He understood and harnessed the power of this principle. His perspective was right, and so it allowed him to enjoy it. He had the right perspective. You see, when your perspective is wrong about life and the Lord, it's going to be impossible for you to rest in the sovereignty of God. Psalms 115 speaks of a great perspective in the sovereignty of God when it says, Not to us, verse 1, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Because of your faithful love, because of your truth, why should the nation say, Where is their God? 
Our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases because he's sovereign. Not to us, though. Not to us. There at the end, we see how sovereign he is. He does whatever he pleases. And the psalmist is okay with that and can rest in that because he has the proper perspective. Not to us. Not to us. Is that your perspective? Is it mine? Generally not, right? Generally, it's, Lord, what about us? Lord, what about me? Lord, bring that to me. Bring that to me. Do that for me. Lord, me, 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 me. It's the wrong perspective. Not to us. The Lord is sovereign. It doesn't matter if you believe it. He is. Isaiah said this in 46, 9 and 10. Remember what happened long ago, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and no one is like me. I declare the end from the beginning, indeed he has. I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place, and I will do all my will. Because he is sovereign. If you're struggling to rest and trust and believe in his sovereign power, I would encourage you to examine your plans, your priorities, and your perspective. They're probably getting in the way. I believe the Lord knows everything. I believe the Lord knew you were going to be here today, sitting in the exact seat you're sitting in. I believe the Lord knew I was going to speak these exact words on this exact day. He knew we were going to all be together right here in this place to worship Him this hour from the very beginning of time because He's sovereign. He knew you were going to hear about that today. If you've been rejecting God, if you've been rejecting His plan, can I encourage you today to embrace it and receive it? He knew you were going to hear this on the radio. He knew you were going to see this on Facebook and decide to stop and watch. If you've been rejecting him, you've heard this for a reason today. Stop rejecting him and receive him and trust him and believe in him. Christ died for you. He gave his life for you. He bled for you. He rose from the dead for you so you could be victorious over death yourself. Repent. And be saved today. Rest in the sovereignty of God. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Let's pray. If that's you and you need the Lord this hour, if you need that great gift of salvation, we invite you to open it and take it. Say this to the Lord. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would save me. I ask by faith that you would forgive me and give me the great gift of eternal life. I thank you for your grace and your goodness. your patience and your willingness to meet me here today thank you for calling my name for giving me ears to hear and eyes to see Father as we prepare to close today I know this is tough I know it's hard to rest life is so short we've got so much we want to get done And harder still is to rest in your sovereignty because our plans and our priorities and our perspectives and all of that's combined into that, Lord, well, it just, it gets in the way. I know it's hard to sit back and trust someone else to take the wheel, to trust someone else has it all figured out, to believe that your plans are better when sometimes they seem so crummy. So, Lord, I pray for those who are struggling with that right now.
Lord, I pray you would help them to trust and to rest in your sovereignty this week. Lord, I pray instead of speaking the lies of the devil to themselves, they would speak the truth of the word of God to themselves this week. I pray they would look in the mirror and say, I'm valuable, I'm loved, I'm cherished. Christ died for me. There's a plan, there's a purpose for my life. I'm still here, so he's not done. Lord, I pray they would speak words like that into themselves. Lord, I pray we would focus on you and who you are so we would know who we really are. Lord, move. Help us to fly. We've fallen enough. Give us the wisdom to fly. In Jesus' name we pray.